Hello and welcome to my retro watches. What have I got in store for you in this episode? Well, there's a slight humming sound coming from the bench, bit of a buzz, and that can only mean one thing, tuning forks, and more the point, Bullover 218 tuning fork movement. Uh, in this video, I'm gonna try and uh, disassemble one, uh, clean it, and then I'll do another episode of where I rebuild it, and hopefully it's gonna run. Now, uh, let's face it, I haven't done many of these. In fact, I've only really done two, and that's been very, very recently. So uh, I'm new, and uh, I might do things wrong, so if there are some experts watching out there on these things, please take my methods with a bit of a pinch of salt, because I'm still very much learning on these movements, but they're absolutely fantastic. So, if you don't know much about the uh, Bullover, uh, the, uh, they made this um, tuning fork, so, so it's a, a sort of early uh, electronic watch. I think it came out in 1960, was the Bullover 214. Uh, turned into quite an iconic watch, that one in itself, and uh, it then had this Space View one, which was really, really nice and a bit of a grail for me. I have got a 214 right here. I'll put a photo up for it as well so you can see that. And um, basically, it's um, a little circuit that runs, um, uh, puts some power into some coils, uh, which interferes with some magnets and makes a tuning fork vibrate at a particular oscillation or particular frequency, should I say, and then that is transferred into motion by the wonder of the index system, which is a sight to behold. It really is. It's absolutely tiny, and I have no idea how they did this back in the 60s. It's, it's crazy. However, the 214 was uh, sort of upgraded to the 218, I think in 1965, from the little bit that I've read, and that's sort of where I come in, really, because uh, I was given um, this particular one here and again I'll put a photo of that one up uh, by a, a, a regular to the to the channel so he, uh, he he's a subscriber and he's a friend of mine because he's now in the Facebook group as well a guy called Pete Hurst and uh, we did a trade so I, I fixed some watches for him and in return he gave me this bullover but it wasn't working and I did try to fix it numerous occasions but I really hadn't got a clue and um, it was I think only well, less than a month ago, I decided to come back to it and have another look and uh, and decided to try and strip it down. And I stripped the dial side down and realized that there was a lot of dirt in, in there, certainly where the center wheel would be, and uh, cleaned all that. And lo and behold, it ran. And uh, I was absolutely gobsmacked that I managed to fix it. And I got a bit hungry for a little bit more. And then another friend of mine, it's, <laughs> it's funny how these come, a guy called Ian Margetts, uh, Margaret, sorry, I got his name wrong. Um, he gave me a box of watches probably about a year ago uh, to have a look to see if I could fix any of them. And in there, I found this one. Now this is, and again, I'll put a photo of, of, of it now, is um, a Citizen tuning fork high sonic. Uh, the thing is with this particular watch, uh, it is um, a, still a bullover. It says, it says Citizen on it but it was patented by Bullover and I think they just let people uh, have a have a go with them and probably bought them under license or something. Now that particular watch was absolutely covered in battery acid. The, uh, the battery must have exploded quite literally and uh, cacked everything inside with uh, its substance. And I'll start putting some more photos up of that now and I'll talk you through. So basically that was um, looked pretty much ruined. And that's what I liked about it because I thought that, I, well, I can strip this down. I've got nothing to lose because it's not gonna work. And um, that way I can have a good test to, to understand the movement a bit better without trying to damage a, one that might be working because they do hold some fairly decent value, these watches. So I cleaned it all as best as I could and got rid of a lot of the acid and a lot of the tarnish and then set about rebuilding it and managed to actually get everything back in position. And as we'll see, the index system is particularly difficult because it's so small, but it, I was quite surprised by the, my ability to get it in. However, it didn't work. Uh, it still didn't hum, and I couldn't work out really why because I thought the mechanics were fine. And then I found out that one of the coil contacts, a little co tiny copper wire, uh, was sort of missing from the post that it should be on. And um, 
Anyway, long story short, I ended up doing some a very crude work with some solder, well, a soldering iron and some solder, and then some um, uh, conductive paint uh, that I've used in digital watches, and I painted all that on, and lo and behold, the watch started vibrating and humming away, and I thought, wow, this thing is gonna go. But sadly not, because I then looked at the index fingers, which again, there'll be a photo of now, and these have little collets on them to hold them in place on the little posts. And both collets were, to start with, were both were fractured. And you have to move these things uh, out the way when you're uh, uninstalling them. And then when you're putting them back in, you need to move them back onto the wheel again. And basically one broke when I was moving it. And the second one was so badly fractured that it wouldn't run at all. So um, what happens next is that I thought, well, I'm gonna I'm not going to give up. I'm going to try and find some um, some fingers. I think that's what they're called, and try and find a donor watch to do that. And I uh, was posting this in the Facebook group, and lo and behold, a guy called Paul, uh, he came to the rescue and he says, "Look, I've got a Bullover uh, 218 that is uh, sitting here. It hums. It doesn't run. I've got no chance of trying to fix it." Um, a little bit scared of these sort of movements they're beyond my uh, capabilities you you're welcome to have it and um, i was quite unbelievably uh, stoked by that uh, i took his offer and it arrived and i looked at it and i thought this movement is far too clean uh, i realized very quickly what was wrong with it it was just the index finger wasn't actually touching the um, index wheel where it should be so i adjusted that and lo and behold that movement started to run uh, straight away and I felt pretty guilty because, you know, all I wanted was these two little fingers and um, he had sent me this absolutely mint or fairly mint condition uh, movement to, to take pits up, to take parts off, sorry. So I decided, no, I'd contact him and say, look, uh, it's a great offer, but it, it's worth too much as it is as running. So um, perhaps I'll do something with that in a video and I will try and find uh, another donor for the um parts that I need which lo and behold the very next day I found one on eBay and I couldn't resist I bought it it was uh, hardly any money particularly and that turned up and the fingers were bent on it <laughs> I couldn't believe it however I managed to straighten them managed to take them off then I had to disassemble the the high sonic watch again and to fit them and then when I fitted them and I turned the index and the pawl levers to the index wheel I know some of this terminology might be going over your heads a bit, but you'll understand when we start going through it. Um, the, the, the watch started running. So the High Sonic is now working. And if you've been following in the Facebook group, uh, you won't have known this yet because I've not announced it, but yes, I have managed to fix it. So absolutely fantastic on that. So that's a lot of talking going on. Um, so the end of result of this is I've now got three um, humming watches sitting here humming away quite nicely which is interesting and I've still got Paul's um, 218 here so I said to him well look I will service that um, because as much as it's running it does look like it's got a bit of dirt in there so it can't help it can't harm to service it so I've decided after doing only two of these to film <laughs> and to see if I can replicate what I've learned so far on camera for hopefully for you guys to enjoy and perhaps get a flavor of these types of movements because they're absolutely fascinating. You've got to think that Bulova um, said back in 1960 that these were accurate to one minute a month. And uh, this was before quartz or anything like that. Uh, that was an absolute revelation in its time. And they are still as accurate today as they were back then. They don't lose any of their accuracy as long as you set them up correctly. Um, I'm not a wizard at setting them up by any stretch and I won't really be able to show you that because there's some equipment that I'd really need. So the plan will be now is to cut to the bench. I'll show you a bit about the movements and um, and then we'll crack on and we'll, we'll strip down the 218 and uh, you can see how that's done and hopefully enjoy. So off we go to the bench. Okay, here we are on the bench. I know I've done a bit of talking so far, so I'll just sort of skip through these. This is my uh, 214, and I haven't done anything to this particularly inside to um, maintain it, not just yet. Uh, this is one to probably look at in the future. Uh, but as you can see there, it has its um, signature 
uh, super smooth tick. So this thing is ticking roughly at about 3, 000, uh, 300 vibrations per second. So if you think about a normal watch that you've got, it might be five or six, and you know you consider that a smooth tick. Well, look at it, look again because this is the best in my opinion. And what goes with it is a very nice humming noise, which I'll demonstrate a little bit later on. Um, then of course we have this particular one that I showed you. This is absolutely gorgeous. It has um, little blue marks on the indices. A lovely, lovely dial. Uh, the case is absolutely mint pretty much and lo and behold somebody has added an uh, a, a display back to it uh, which i think is rather nice indeed and you can just see the tops here of the tuning fork uh, so a wonderful wonderful watch and then lastly the high sonic so there we go um, this thing is lovely you know i like have a thing for the japanese watches and uh, this is no exception at all uh, we will be borrowing the crown out of this uh, because the movement we're going to try and take apart hasn't got a crown and I'm going to need it. And then on the assembly, I may use the dial and the hands off this one uh, so we can at least have a look at it running. So without further ado, we'll cut to the movement that we're going to service. We are looking at the microscope and we are looking at the movement we're about to service. Now, I should have done some outer shots of this really first of all, because we're looking a bit close up. Uh, these are the coils and surrounding them are the tuning forks. And it might look out of uh, focus, but that is because it's vibrating. The battery is here and uh, this on these, the battery sits the opposite way around to what you would normally think it would, which probably catches a few people out who are new to them. And there we are, it's a 2181. There are different versions of the 218, and from what I can see, certainly from what I've got, um, the um, movement side, if you like, so the mechanical bits here is all the same. Uh, it seems that the differences, a lot of it, seem to be on the other side with the dial. Now, um, I'm trying to get this better in focus for you right now. What you're looking at here is the these Levers have been talking about all the fingers and they go towards that. I'm just trying to find something to point with. So if we look at here, these two fingers, so you've got an index finger and what's called the paw finger and they have little tiny jaws on the end. And then this wheel here that you can just see is the index wheel. And that's made out of some exotic material and it has these 300 teeth. Now we're at times 20 magnification and we cannot see the teeth at all. Um, even at 40, you are struggling to see them. Uh, the wheel itself is only 2.4 millimeters in diameter. I'm trying to think what that would be in um, Imperial, somewhere around about 332, I would have thought. Um, so. Um, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to push the crown in and you hopefully might just see one of those the index touch and then lo and behold off we go. So the autofocus is going to go a bit crazy. I can't switch it off on this because it's just a little phone. Uh, what I'm going to try and do is take my microphone. There you go. So you're able to hear it there. Now, um, what um, happened here, so if you see the, the outer one, so this one here, this finger, uh, when Paul sent me this, uh, basically when it's in its running position, this was actually moved too far out and all I did was adjust it and it started. Uh, what the camera's not really picking up very well is there's a lot of dirt in there and that's why I want to uh, service it. So I'm going to cut to the bench now and we'll start to take away, take apart the um, dial side and then we'll go to the movement side. Uh, what we also need to make sure that we do is remove the battery 
and then we need to make sure that the crown is pulled out before we do anything because pulling the crown out uh, as I will show you now of course stops the, the movement or hacks it if you like and that's important because that little index wheel is probably the most delicate thing you'll ever see um, so you have to handle it with great care and if you had the hands on a movement at this particular point in time while it was still running and you were trying to take the hands off you could risk damaging the wheel by spinning it backwards against the the jewels and you could break some teeth off and if you do that that's it it's history you've got to buy a new one right here we are on the dial side now uh, of course we haven't got a dial haven't got any hands uh, because Paul just sent this as a donor we're also missing the hour wheel as well so when we do rebuild this I'll need to borrow it out of one of mine to uh, show it running properly um, and of course this one is the uh, date version I guess some of them well I think actually if I'm right the 218 came with dates 214s never did um, and then some of them have also or some of the 218s have also got day dates so we have a little uh, retaining cover which is the first thing to come off and the thing is with these as well is that I'm, I'm sorry if you're going to see a lot of my fingers is that those coils um, and the tuning fork are magnetized so realistically it's the best to work with uh, brass tweezers now my brass tweezers aren't very good I will confess um, and what happens as well if you have a little moment with some screws they nearly always end up stuck to the coil so in some respects it's great because it might catch some ping moments but equally it's annoying because then you've got to demagnetize the screw and then you've potentially got to demagnetize your tweezers if you haven't got brass tweezers so it just uh, is a little bit infuriating but so it's going to gently take that off because straight away over here you have uh, the, the spring just trying to get that out of the way so this is the um, the click if you like for the for the date wheel and it's uh, powered up by a little spring there and uh, you've just got to be a little bit careful with those because of course they like to uh, jump and uh, disappear so carefully move that to one side and with this thing here if you can't get it with the tweezers good old Rodico to the rescue Okay, just had a bit of a mishap with my uh, microphone so if the sound was uh, was off then I'll find out in editing <laughs> so this is the mechanism as well for the uh, the date change uh, at 12 and it has this little tension spring which goes into the movement over here and is oops see now I didn't want that to happen I was trying to take the load off and uh, of course it uh, made everything fly so a bit of bad method there and as I said previously when things fly the coil catches them so at some point I will need to demagnetize that part so now all we have is the um, all the keyless assembly and then the uh, the cannon pinion and of course the uh, seconds wheel the minute wheel I do apologize So remove the set and lever spring and I can then remove he says the minute wheel and 
and the wheel that I always forget the name of. It's like a drive wheel, isn't it? So I'll just leave that, see if I can get it. I will get that in just a moment because the uh, the yoke here has a, a spring. I don't know if you can see that. And of course we must try not to have a repeat performance of what's just happened on the last spring. But we need to take the load off that. And it's unusually tricky today. I think that's possibly why. So I've got myself in a bit of a mess there. Oh, and you're not even really on the camera either, which doesn't help. Uh, normally I've just managed to unhook this spring, uh, but on this particular one, it's proving to be a little bit stubborn. And it's actually trying to remove the yoke as I've just done there now. And that will, well, that should just come out, but it's not um, playing ball. So I will leave that for a moment and have a look at that um, in just a minute off camera probably. And then we have this uh, little spring here. And this just comes out from taking that screw off like so and the setting lever is also being a bit stubborn certainly not my day at the moment is it Ah, because I'm being a bit silly. Uh, to remove that, I've just remembered. <laughs> we have to turn the movement over. So in order to do that, actually, I can now, should now be able to get hold of that. I'm sure that's going to drop out. So if I turn the movement over, The, um has a release screw to get the crown out and once you've unscrewed that of course there are the parts or well, there are some of the parts not the part we were trying to remove mind because that is the clutch and this little drive wheel which drives the uh, date uh, corrector And now we can finally get rid of the setting lever. And that's the screw just protruding there. And this one still doesn't want to come off, does it? So, and then the moment I said that, it does. Okay, so I'll deal with that spring at, at the last. Um, the this is the cannon pinion and we have to remove these two screws to get that out 
and it would help if I found the right size screwdriver. Very surprisingly, I'm actually doing this by eye without any uh, magnification as well, so I'm probably being a bit stupid, really. He's struggling with this screw. And then once again, it's ended up on the coil. So I told you it was going to happen, and it did. And there we have it. That is that side stripped. And uh, we can now turn our attention to the other side. So we, before we start stripping this side, um, I need to move those fingers a little bit out of the way for safety. And I use, I've got an old, very old blue oiler here that is bent and you put it in the slot and I just need to move them like so. Now at this point, or before you move them should I say, should have said this for beforehand, um, it's best to uh, take a picture of where they were. Uh, it will help you uh, later down the line when you need to uh, rebuild. So now I think they're just out the way enough to be uh, safe so I'm not going to knock them we can now remove the uh, uh, train uh, cover right so the dial side wasn't too complicated and this side you might think is complicated but I don't think it is too much from working on mechanical watches um, you just got to be ultra careful of course of that index wheel so we've got to remove the uh, cover uh, the train uh, bridge and to do that we have a few screws a very small one that's got stuck to the coil what a surprise so this screw is different to all of the others so just make a note of that if you are ever going to do this screw get it with a bit of roddy coat right okay so to get the um, train off the train bridge sorry just be very careful And there we have it. So there are the wheels all in their little seats and I will show you those a bit closer up now back on the microscope. So here we are, here's the train and there's the little index wheel which is falling in a really awkward position for me to get out actually so we'll have to hope we can do that. Uh, now of course uh, I Again, what I haven't said really is that if you were going to attempt this um, job for yourself, 
then you are really going to need a microscope. There's no way, I don't think you could do this any other way. Certainly reseating these things uh, and, and adjusting as well, to be fair. So um, set yourself up with a microscope and you won't go too far wrong. So I'm going to remove these uh, under the microscope because it makes it a little bit easier for me. And then of course you need to keep them very safe. Now the index wheel has its own tool uh, to keep that safe. I haven't got the luxury of owning that tool. So I've just got to be hopeful that I'm not going to damage it. And then this wheel here is usually a little bit spring loaded. And now it's time for this wheel. Now you don't really want to grab it by the wheel. You will always want to grab it by the pinion. I'm just hoping that you're all in focus. I'm just going to try and zoom out a bit. And there we go. I was particularly quiet because uh, <laughs> that's a tricky manoeuvre, uh, but we've got it out without any damage. And hopefully uh, you might be able to see, now if I try and get it into some focus and zoom in again, there's plenty of dirt. So whether it's been serviced or not before, I don't know, but it could do with it. So now we'll go back onto the bench and we'll strip the rest of the parts off. And um, then we're nearing the end. Okay, so now we want to try and uh, remove the um, the um, pallet um, fork. It's not a fork, is it? Because I'm referring it to it as a as a normal watch. Uh, the pallet uh, finger, and this is actually a cam, so that screw is not going to come out. And the reason I've got to move this uh, now is because we need to remove the fork, and of course this is in the way. And again, it's one of those things. It's got, well, it's got a big screw here and a smaller screw. And you're probably well advised actually to move it uh, further out the way. Because again, you do not want to damage that finger at all. I actually rebuilt mine. The, the, um, High Sonic the other day and uh, forgot to even put this part on and I'd already got the train bridge back on as well uh, it was uh, a horrible moment so I'm just being careful because I can see I'm moving that around a bit which is not what I wanted to do but there So you need to keep that very, very safe. So now it's time to get the uh, tuning fork uh, removed. Um, and you have to also um, take all the screws out for the coils. So note that there's a small or a smaller screw at the bottom side of this one and a bigger one at the top. And don't try and take them out at this stage. Just undo all the screws that you see. There's this one at the top here. That joins the two coils together. And then we have the large one on the battery connector side. And what a surprise. So once those are removed, it's time to remove the uh, coil, uh, the tuning fork 
uh, screws which are here and again just be very very careful this stays on the fork uh, the index finger Okay, forgive my silence. Just trying to concentrate. Okay, so now we must loosen the fork, and if it's been there a long time, it might be a bit stubborn. So there we are, you can see now that it's loose. And you can kind of lift it up. And what I've just found is that you sort of then can remove the circuits like so. So they just slide out because they sit in the middle, you know, through the case, or the, the main plate, sorry. So again, we just pull that out, keep those somewhere safe and then be very careful again with the tuning fork. Now I have read somewhere on the internet that to clean these, it's best just to dip them. Um, so I'm gonna dip them in um, Renata, so just sort of solv solvent-based type um, cleaner. Uh, make sure the cleaner is clean, that you haven't used it for anything else because if you've got any sort of bits of metal in there, the magnet's gonna retract it. I've been told not to use it in an ultrasonic as well because you run the chance of taking the um, some of the magnetism away, which is not what you want to do. So just a quick clean on those and equally the uh, the Paul jewel as well. Just dip that and clean that part as best you can without uh, trying to run it through any machines. So with that out the way, uh, we have, this is part of the hacking mechanism, so we have to be a little bit careful there again because as you can see, there's one of those little dreaded springs. Keep having a tendency to take everything off, off the camera. So forgive me if you get some poor shots. I've only got one take on this. I can't. don't want to rebuild it again uh, if I go wrong. And I'm just trying to put my parts in a parts tray. So there's the tricky parts uh, done. Uh, there's also this little spring here. Okay, and we're almost there. So uh, what I've found is that this uh, sort of plastic or rubber uh, thing on the end doesn't seem to want to come off, so don't try and pry that. You have these washers here, which will be removed, and it always seems to be that there's a copper one on the bottom and a steel one on the top. So remove those for cleaning and keep them uh, somewhere safe, definitely. I'd be interested to know why one's one type of steel and one's the other. Uh, I don't know enough about electronics um, to understand why that would be. So we're about there. The uh, little cam that I was referring to earlier on is here and that will just push straight through the case. And then lastly, uh, you can remove the uh, battery contact here at the bottom. like so 
and that is it guys that is the strip down of a, a 218 pull over a tuning fork movement a remarkably um straightforward in my opinion uh, there's a few little tricky things to be wary of but if you uh, handle it with great care and uh, you're confident enough then you shouldn't have any worries obviously rebuilding it is a a new world compared to stripping down i think anyone that's working on watches knows and appreciates that it doesn't take too long to strip a movement down but it can take three four times as long to rebuild it um but you know they have a lot of characteristics these guys of um a mechanical watch uh, but interestingly enough with a few um early electronic components thrown in uh, i really am finding them fascinating right now and um uh, looking forward to cleaning this one and rebuilding it for you in the next video so uh, i'm going to call it a day um, i hope that you've uh, enjoyed this as much as i have and uh, you um, might have a new appreciation for a tuning fork watch or if you've got one in your collection you've been scared to look at it and take it apart maybe you've got the confidence now to try and have a go um, so good luck and um, you know thanks very much for watching this video please leave plenty of comments down below i will try and answer as many as i can and i will read every single one of them and of course don't forget to join the facebook group uh, retro vintage watches and restorations it's continually growing every day nearly eight thousand people now from all over the world uh, all have a share of love of watches and fixing watches um so you're all more than welcome in there. And of course, if you get a chance and you want to support me, you can either buy one of my t-shirts that's in the links below the video um, or in my merch shop on uh, YouTube, or you can have a look at my uh, tool page on my website uh, where there's all my affiliate links to tools that I recommend that uh, the um, beginner buy. And I get a little bit of a kickback from that which certainly helps to fund my hobby and uh, bring these uh, entertaining videos to you guys so with that all done thanks very much for watching and i'll see you very soon in the uh, the next episode of this one i'm not going to leave it for very long like i have done with other ones that I've, i'm still haven't completed i plan to do this one next and um, so you will be able to see the uh, next episode very very shortly and of course if you're watching in the future it'll be um, at the end of the video now there'll be a link to the rebuild so how convenient is that <laughs> thanks very much guys catch you in the next one